morning. Welcome to our Facebook live broadcast. It's a pleasure for me to be um, with you. I hope that you invite me to be in your lounge this morning. That I can sit with you while you are sitting in your lounge. That I can be there and minister this word of God to you this morning. It would be a great pleasure for me to be hosted by you. Just before I want to start, I just want to remind you that uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon is going to be a world, well, a nationwide prayer meeting that's going to be held in your house. What's going to happen is 3 o'clock, everybody just go outside. They ask that we will move up to the where the roadside is and just stand there, lift our hands and start calling out to God for our nation. For the disease, this COVID-19 and the second wave of this thing that is exploding in our nation. And let us just declare God's healing over this disease. If you will join me this afternoon, wherever you find yourself, just go out 3 o'clock. And it's going to be in a spirit of corporate thing. And we're going to pray against this disease. That God will heal our land, our nation. It will be the first time that the whole nation will stand outside and just give God the glory for Him who is the healer. He is the healer. So I invite you to 3 o'clock this afternoon to come and join us. This morning, again, I'm in the audience of my wife and uh, I said to her, it's, it's actually very awkward to minister when only your wife is there but I love it in the sense that it doesn't change God but yes it would be awesome if the whole house was full of God's children and we could have been together and, and uh, just share this precious time that God gives us in His Word. But, let me leave it there. I'm in your house, that's all that matters. This morning, this is something that's very close to my heart. And I, I'm not sure I'm going to give it my best to explain to you something that makes it very different from just being normal Christian and it's called the secret place if you would remember with me last year somewhere in, in this time of lockdown I ministered on wedding on God and yes um, wedding on God is it is the most important thing that there is and I, I believe that that uh, the children of God doesn't know how to do that. Because it's something that you need to learn. You need to teach it yourself. You, you, you need to get involved into that. It is very, very, uh, it's a needy thing for you and me to wear on God. But this morning, I there's a lot of things that are going through my mind. When I, when I want to speak about the secret place, when I think about the secret place, and I try and imagine getting that picture of the spiritual secret place, not just what the Bible says, going to your innermost room, and no, no, not, not that one. Just to, to imagine, and that's what I want to explain to you this morning. There is a thing that you and me as Christians, as children of God, as spiritual people, we must learn, we must understand this. And this, 
And what you and I need to understand is this. How God works, how He operates, and how to understand Him. But, but there's scripture that says you cannot understand God because God's thoughts are higher than ours. His ways are how, is, is higher than ours. I, I want to say this to you. That was true in the Old Dispensation. In the time of the Old Testament. But it has been revised the day that you and I gave our life to Jesus. We have all got this opportunity, this amazing place of discovering God face to face so it's important it's not it's not enough to be used by god it's not enough to function in his power and those things all i'm not contradicting myself but you have to understand that the gifts are irrevocable it doesn't matter if you are in it or not in it the gifts are not it is irrevocable it's not enough for us to be used by God. You must understand God and understand the system of operation. When I, when, I, when I wrote this, I thought about Moses. I thought about David, Paul, Peter, all these guys that, that were so close. They were on a different place. They were on a different level. They were totally in a different time, although they were in the same time. Moses said something to God. In, in Psalm, well, the scripture says in Psalm 103 verse 7, it says that Moses, God taught Moses his ways and unto the people his acts. David come in the same sense in Psalm 25 and he said to God, God, show me your ways. That's a, such a great difference between the ways and the acts. What, what people do in the now time, people pray and they release prayers, they speak. And they want God to come and change things in the now for their lives. And that is fine. It's good. But here's the problem with that. And I think many times God is not doing that for this reason of the acts and His ways. The Israelites, they dwelt in the, in the, in the wilderness. They were in the desert for 40 years. For 40 years, they saw miracle on miracle on miracle. They lived in miracles. They lived. They were the manifestation of God's miracles, of God's acts. And Moses led them. But somewhere in this, Moses said, God, you know what? I've seen the healings, I've seen the provision, I've seen how you just come by fire by night and by cloud by day. I've seen all these things, our experiences that I do experience. But you know what? In it all, I still don't know who you are. And that's why I'm saying, I've said it many a time. I don't want to live in the miracles of God. Because if you live in the miracles of God, it means you need to live in the in difficulties to difficulties to difficulties. To scenarios of, of pain and hurt and discomfort. No, I don't want to live like that. And that's my, my prompting to you this morning. And I want, I want to prompt you. By the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is to seek God in the secret place. So that you and I, so that you can get out of the place of just one God. To, to come and bring a release in the natural. 
because there's much more to that. God is not just a God who, who solves our problems. He is not just a God who intervenes when we are in trouble. He is not, he is not that God. There is more to God than that. If you and I, if you can understand for one moment, if you can really focus and get connected to God's heart, synchronize with His heart in a fullness, I truly believe that God's desire for a relationship with you and me is everything that He wants. Isn't that what he said when he said, seek you first the kingdom of God and the authority and the righteousness of it, the authority of it? What? And all the other things, these things that we pray for, these things that matters for us, so that these things can be added unto us. He will add things to you. He will do things to you. He will give you things. He will be the prov provider. He will be the healer. He will be whatever you need at that moment. He is that. But I want to take you into something this morning. And we mustn't box God thinking that the way He moved yesterday, the things He did yesterday, is the same things and He's going to do it the same way today. Don't box God in that. He's not functioning, working like that. You must be flexible. You must have that. Pastor, listen to me. Preacher, listen to me. Man and woman of God, son and daughter of God, listen to me. You need to be flexible. You must have that flexibility, that sensitivity, that discernment to move when God moves and that only happens if you're a man of his presence I, I want to explain these things because I know that in this time in this in this definite time that we are in now there's so much questions people ask questions. There's uncertainties. There is things that doesn't make sense. So God is moving. Although it doesn't look like it. God is moving. Don't box him. He's moving. But if you are not a, if you are not connected, if you are not in that divine place, you'll miss it. You'll miss the move. And you get stuck in the past. Psalm 139, Psalm 139, verse 7 to, 2, 7 to 12, reveals to us something that is so glorious. It's God's omnipresence. Just listen to this. This is amazing. This is amazing. It is in this psalm that David made it understandable unto us that it is impossible for man to hide from God. You cannot hide from God. Why? Because God's everywhere. His omnipresence is His ability to be everywhere. Isn't that amazing? God is everywhere. You have to hear what I'm saying. God is everywhere. Let me read it to you. Psalm 139, verse 7 to 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? It's a question. David, it's, David asks this question. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, 
Behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me, indeed the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. What an amazing passage. From the scripture, it is established, and this is a fact, that God is everywhere. He is everywhere present. To me, it's very comforting to know that God's present everywhere. But then, and this is, this is so important, I want you to hear what I'm saying this morning. God is everywhere, but then, God does not meet with people everywhere. Understand this. God is everywhere in His sovereignty, in His omnipresence. But the place of encounter has always been in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and throughout eternity, God does not meet with people everywhere. That changes something. That changes perceptions. You know what? In this rush, in this hustle and bustle of our lives, in this busyness, people find their place or their way to, to interact with God in their vehicle to their workplace. Or when they do get a chance at home, quickly. And the thought is, but I'm his child and God listens always to me, he's always with me and God will... It's not true. It's not true. In the dealings of God with men, location and atmosphere matters. Everywhere is not a favorable place for meeting with God. Everywhere is not that favorable place to meet with God. Just because we are a New Testament and Christ died for us and the veil has been torn doesn't mean that everywhere is a conducive place. You have to hear what I'm saying. When Jesus went to pray, how many times did He just say to His disciples, Stay here, I'm going to pray. They saw him many times, just early in the morning, he's just come and pray. When he went to pray, when he went to go and be intimate with his father, he always went up into, I want you to hear this, he always went up into the mountain or into a mountain. What does it mean? Let me read the scripture. Matthew 14 verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. I'll explain that because I want you to understand that. I want you to see that. That he, he, he never went up a mountain to pray. Up a mountain to pray. By itself, going up a mountain means that when you, when, you, when you look at Moses, God called him and he went up the mountain. There's always a difficulty when it comes to pray, spending time with God. There will always be something that you need to leave behind 
to get to the place where you can spend time with Him. There will be the television. There will be your wife. There will be your husband. There will be the children. There will be the animals. There will be your work. There will be, there will be, there will always be something that you must leave behind and move from that position into a place where you can spend time with Him. Jesus never went up a mountain to pray. He went up into a mountain. Big difference. I'm saying it again. Just because you and I, because we are New Testament, and because Christ died for us on the cross, and because the veil has been torn, that doesn't mean that everywhere is a conducive place for God to meet us. The concept of a secret place is one, is a scriptural mystery that is behind the unusual manifestations of life and the power of God upon men. It's a mystery. Secret place is a mysterious place. You have to understand that. When you see a man, a woman, a pastor, or any individual, when they function on, in unusual or unusual dimensions of the grace, of the splendor of life, and the power and the presence of God, then you can know that that individual is a person of the secret place. Remember that the disciples, they watched Jesus. They saw Him every day. He went up into the mountain, He comes back and He did just miracles on miracles on miracles. And they never could understand how is it possible that when, when a man brings his son, who is uh, demon-possessed, that they couldn't even cast this, this thing out. They couldn't understand how it does work until they snapped, until they understood exactly. You see, Jesus went up into the mountain and He spent time with the Father and He comes back. He, he spent five, four, four, five, six, seven hours in the presence of God and He comes back and He's doing miracles in seconds. But in this, in this now time of our lives, you and I, we want to do that same miracles without even spending an hour in the presence of God. It's not going to happen. God is everywhere, but He doesn't meet with people everywhere. Let me explain like this. If you've got a business meeting with a, with a businessman, two business people meet. You've got a meeting with them. You don't go to stand, go to stand there in the parking lot and discuss destiny alerting businesses. You know we're not going to do it, is it? No, you're not going to do that. If I say to you, I, I want to discuss a business with you, business opportunities with you, or something regarding business, I'm not going to meet you outside on the corner of the street. You find a conducive place to have that meeting. When world rulers, when world leaders, when they, when they plan a meeting, discuss something, you know what they do? Much preparation goes into that scheduled meeting. They plan that so far ahead. Because the conversation that's going to take place between those world leaders, it, 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 it's going to be decisive. It's going to, it's going to influence the destiny of millions. And so they're scheduling, they're planning, they're they, they, they create an atmosphere for that. The location is important. The commitment towards that is important. important. The accommodation is, is, is important. The hospitality is important. Every detail of that scheduled meeting is planned out and prepared for. 
And then for us, for men, we want to meet with God and host His presence. And we believe just because God loves us, atmosphere and location doesn't matter. Isn't it what the scripture says that God inhabits the praises of His people? If that is true, what does it mean? It means that His people create an atmosphere, create a location for God so that He can come and in this atmosphere be God. Every house, every home, your house, let me say it like that, your house, every house, my house, your house, his house, her house, every house, every home has several rooms inside the home that reflects the value of the people who you want to meet. What do you say? There is people that will come to see you and you will meet them at the gate and you will speak to them about the issues at the gate. Why? Is it because you devaluate them? No, no, no. You're not devaluating them. But it's just a matter of they did not earn the right to your living room or to your bedroom. There are a few people that you can grant access to every to into your house. There are others. There are those people that you will grant access into your into your bedroom, into your lounge, because of the quality and the level of your discussion with them. You don't invite me into your bedroom. Is it because you devaluate me? No, it's not. Because it's just, it is just, the quality of that place is special. The quality of that place where you invite me into is, there's an atmosphere there. It's a, a location that's beautiful. It's a place that you will take a loved one day. I hope you understand what I'm saying. God is a God of the secret place. I'm telling you, everything that is noble and mighty in the kingdom is hidden. I'm saying again, everything in the kingdom that is noble and mighty is hidden. Isn't it that what God said when He said, Call unto me. Now listen. No, He said, Call unto me now, answer. And then I will show you great and mighty things fenced in and hidden. Things that you've never seen, see, or understand. So you have to understand that there is things regarding your life and my life. That's hidden. Things regarding your family that's hidden. It is not in the natural available. The understanding of that is in the secret place. The concept of God hiding Himself is a concept that for most believers, they just don't understand it. Why is it that God hides himself from me. Let me read it again. The, con the concept of God hiding himself is a concept that believers don't understand. Many don't understand. Especially believers who is not very balanced in their spiritual walk with God. You see, they're in balance is what not knowing God properly creates. Why is God hiding Himself from me? 
Why is God hiding certain things from me? Maybe you think, how does a God who is love, and He says that He loves all people, delights Himself in hiding Himself? Why? Why is the pursuit made so difficult? The truth is this God is with you. God is not missing. God is not gone. He's not laid down. He's not on holiday. He's not gone. God is with you. If you have your Bible with you, God is with you. When people preach, I'm saying this to you this morning. When people preach, when you listen to a sermon, when you listen to people that ministering over whatever form of social media, whatever platform, look at the proofs, look at the results. Preachers do that. They look at the proof of what they preach and they look at the results of what they preach. Is it that people embrace that, apply it, and that it manifests in their lives? They look at those things. But for you that's looking at us this morning, where's the proofs? Where's the results? Because the Bible says, wisdom is proved right by your children. You cannot just believe what I'm saying to you. That what I say to you Sunday for Sunday, in a week's days, that is not enough to sustain you. That is not enough. You cannot believe everything that is said because it's well-meaning. It's important that you measure, that you understand, that you see, search, and proof that the revelation that you receive, prove that so that you can see the results of that. God hides Himself is a system in the kingdom. Everything that is glorious is never revealed. It's hidden. Moses said, show me your glory. Show me your glory. It's hidden. It is your pursuit that reveals it. It's the kingdom system. It is not even just for God when you, or let me, let me say it rather like this. When you go and you buy yourself a new phone, a cell phone, a smartphone from whoever, MTN, Vodacom. When you, when you get that phone, do they just give you the phone like this? There's a phone, okay, thank you, goodbye. No, they don't. They'll open the phone, the box, and they'll take the phone out. And they will explain some stuff about this phone to you. They will tell you that this and this and this and this and this. In the olden days, you would receive a manual this thick. So when you take that phone in your hand and you don't go through the manual, you will not know how this phone works. But today it's easy, Google, YouTube. And I'm telling you, if you want to know ex exactly what your phone can do, you have to Google it. Because you'll never discover it by yourself. You have to Google it. 
It's so amazing when you, when you take that manual and you start looking through it and you see this is written in German, Italian, French, in so many languages. And this whole instruction manual regarding that appliance is like, wow, this thick for this little small thing. And then the fun comes when you, when you get home and you have to set up that phone manually. Man, what a struggle. Get all the accounts in line, get all the accounts in there, asking you for your passwords and, and all the email addresses and all those things. And the one thing you do, you have to catch it. And when you do another thing and it works, you have to catch it also. You have to keep on catching stuff so that you know where you're going with this thing. Why? Because the value of that. So God, who is most valuable, cannot just reveal Himself just because He loves you. But when it comes to redemption, when it comes to redemption, God is not hiding Himself. In fact, He's coming down. He's coming down. He's coming down to the people. That's why you will find the people that just gave their lives to Jesus. He's so real to them. It is amazing how real Jesus is to people who just gave their lives to Him. But along the line, three, four, five years along the line, when you speak to them, if they are still in the kingdom, let's, let's say that like that. Because God is hiding Himself and He wants us to search Him, seek Him out the things. He comes down, in redemption He comes down and He meets you, He meets the person. But when it has to do with intimacy and our walk with God, God does not expose Himself callously. He hides Himself in light. Hence the concept of the secret place. Everything that is glorious is hidden. It is called the mystery of the veil. Many of the people believe that just because the veil has been torn and the temple is it's, it's open and God is now exposing Himself to everyone. That's not true. Not so. Not so. The veil has many, many revelations to it. Just because the veil has been torn in the temple doesn't mean that the concept and the idea of veiling things have disappeared. I'm telling you, you have to hear what I'm saying, church, friend, family. The veil is no more. It's torn. But that doesn't mean that God is not hiding the things still for us to discover. Everything that is glorious is covered. Imagine this, if your heart was on your head, I just, just, just picture, just picture, I want to explain something. If your heart was on your head, can you imagine for one moment what the enemy would have done with it? Your heart was visible on your head. Imagine somebody can just come and just hold your heart in his hand and squeeze it. Imagine. So God decided to hide your heart in your chest and cover it with ribs. Why? Because of its vitality. Because it's important. Someone slaps you and, and hits you on the chin 
and wow, it hurts, it's painful, but it's not killing you. But somebody holds your heart in his hand and he's got the right, he's got the ability to squeeze your heart like that. But you'll die. So in God's wisdom, because of His excellency of that organ, He eats it. He hides it. That organ is so special that He has to hide it. Let me take another example. Imagine if a woman got pregnant on her head. That sounds stupid. Imagine that baby would have, the, the fetus, the baby would have grown on her head. Can you imagine? Just think of what would the enemy have done when he sees, when he's looking at that babies while they are growing. So God created a system to make sure that the baby is hidden and safe while growing. And it's called the womb. The baby is growing. Yes, it's growing. Where is the baby in the womb? Can you see the womb? No. So the womb is hidden. Why? Because of the vitality of the womb. Why is the heart hidden? Because the vitality of the heart. So that baby that grows in a womb, that grows in that hidden place, that place that you cannot see, will only be revealed at the right time. So the wisdoms, the ideas about life, helps us to understand the principles of God, that everything that is glorious is veiled. Everything that is glorious is covered. It's hidden. If somebody would come and give you something in a package, wrapped in a package, or you go and you buy yourself something, and when you take the package, you look at the package like this, and you see, but this is torn. The package is kind of open. The concealment is no more there. What do you do? You give it back. You return it. You return it. The fact is, there are products that if you find that the covering has been damaged at the time of your purchase, you have to return it back. God is a God of the secret place. Psalm 91, verse 1 and 2. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Just that, that little part, it's the information that is revealed to us there. That the scripture tells us that it's possible for you and me to dwell in a secret place. It's possible. What do you mean? I'm saying to you, it's possible to dwell in that secret place. You have to understand this, that the secret place is not the house of God. You come to the house of God, yes, and we fellowship together. Scripture. That's scripture. You can be planted in terms of your consistency, your loyalty in the house of God, yes. Praise God for all of you that's watching. But looking at that verse again, Psalm 91, verse 1 and 2, it doesn't say them. It doesn't say they. It doesn't speak of a corporate thing. It doesn't speak of a corporate thing at all. It says He, meaning individually you and you and you and me he that dwelleth 
present continuous tense. Who lives in is what it means when you dwells there. Who lives in, who walks in that secret place. Who lives, listen, who lives, who walks, not visits. People often visit the secret place, not, and then they leave. He that dwelleth in that secret place of the Most High, the Bible says, shall abide. Meaning, he, you, me, the next guy, he who dwells, who walks, who lives in a secret place. Bible says, shall abide. Meaning, it becomes your address. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. The secret place is real. But you have to understand that the secret place is not necessarily a physical location. Although it can be a physical location. It's possible. If I want to go into my secret place, in the physical, I go into my study. It's my, my secret place. So you can have a, a place in your house, a room in your house, a certain place that you, that you uh, picked out in your house and say, this is where I'm going to meet with God. Great. But that is a physical secret place for other people to understand. Listen, if I'm going if I go there, don't bother me. Don't call me. Don't ask me something. If I go there, I'm going there because I want to be with God. And when you are there with God, then you go to the secret place spiritually. The secret place is a spiritual state. It is a posture that the man can take that allows him to access where God is. It's powerful. The secret place is that place, that action. It's an action. It's a work. It's not something that just happens. You go into that place that you've figured and sorted out as your secret place. And you go into your study. And you go and sit there on your chair. Or you go and stand there and you say, God, I'm here. God, I'm ready. I'm God. I, I want to enter into. I want to go into. It's a place where you access. Where God is. Listen. You access it where God is. It's not a place where you just dump your grocery list. You access where God is. Can I take you into another place? Thank you, Holy Spirit. We live our lives in this realm of the natural. This realm of the natural, it speaks of flesh. It speaks of body. It speaks of outer court. If you think of Moses' tabernacle, it speaks of the outer court. And when you can in your, in your imagination, see yourself walking into, into the past, into Moses' time, into the outer court. You will find it's a busy place. It's a place where there's devastation. There's a place where people come to that place and they bring animals to be sacrificed for their sin. They, it's a place where blood flows. It's a place where there's a smell. Of, of blood, of death, of that flesh burning on the altar. It's a place where the priests, where the hands are, are full of blood. And it's just chaos there. It's a place of pandemic. It's a place of chaos. It's a place of losing your job. It's a place of losing a family member. It's a place of divorce. It's a place of, it's the natural realm. 
And now what people do is, they experience themselves in this natural realm. And they see the devastation. They've got, they've got millions of questions in the, in the outer court. Because nothing in the outer court works for them when they try to have a conversation with God. And then they have to go into another place. But that place is called a holy place. You can imagine, God calls Moses up the mountain. Moses is on ground level. And now Moses, who's not a young man, he needs to climb the mountain. He needs to leave behind everything that's, that's there, important to him. He needs to leave it behind. And he's, he has to climb the mountain, climb the mountain. And that's what, the same thing. You move out of the outer court into the holy place. You leave everything behind. You leave your husband, your child, your children, your, 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 your wife, your business. You leave everything behind and you move into the holy place. And when you enter into that holy place, after you wash your, your face and you say, God, I want to see clearly. You move into that place and you find yourself in the presence of the menorah, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, in the presence of the anointing oil, in the presence there where you get your wick, wick, your wick uh, trimmed. And when you, when you look at the, the, the table of the showbread and you just know that Jesus is your provider, you know that Jesus is there for you, you know that Jesus is everything, He's the way, the truth and the life, He's the only way to the Father, and, you, and, you, and the, the preciousness of the oil there, and then you experience Him in, all, in, in different ways. The experience that you have with Him there is not the experience that you will have, will have with Him in the outer world. And then you, you go to the, the, the altar of incense and you praise Him and you just glorify Him for who He is. Glorify Him for His preciousness. You glorify Him for the beauty of who He is. The greatness, the thanksgiving of and then you, you climb, Moses can get up higher and higher and higher and higher. Jesus never had to walk through all these steps. Jesus never had to walk through the, the, the outer court and bring a sacrifice. He never had to, to put himself on the altar there when he wants to go and see the Father. He never had to wash his hands and his face and look into the basin the basin of water. He never had to walk into the holy place and look at the table of showbread and look at the menorah. No, he immediately walked in, into, into the mountain. He's immediately into that place because he never lost connection. He never lost focus. He never been intimidated and overwhelmed by his natural life. And there you are, you go into the holy of holies to the Holy of Holies. And what you find there is just another atmosphere, another location, another fragrance. The, the, what's in there, the Ark of the Covenant, the angels that's covering the mercy seat. The Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, meaning God's there. God's there. Don't try and look for God in the outer court. He's not there. Don't try and look for God in a holy place. He's not there. God is in the Holy of Holies. He's there in the secret place. If it is the secret place, then you'll find them there. Listen. If it's truly the secret place, that's the only place that you'll find Him. God's there. God is there in the Holy of Holies. But when it comes to the secret place, There were many things that happened on Mount Zion. The house of God, or the city of God. 
is a place of unobstructed thoughts and ideas. And it's a place to abide. If it comes to the Holy of Holies, if it comes to the secret place, I said Mount Zion, the house of God, where God is, where the place where God is, it's a place where unobstructed thoughts and ideas abide. You cannot go in there with the mentality of the outer world. You cannot go in there and think that you're going to spend time with God in the secret place experiencing Him. God didn't speak to Moses, giving Moses the commandments while he was on ground zero among the people. It was just too vital. He had to call him up. Up. Up the mountain. That secret place. Unobstructed thoughts. It's the place of unobstructed thoughts. The secret place is a place where you and God has an affair. Not you and the prophet, not you and the apostle, not you and the members of the church, not you and your wife, not you and your children, not you and your husband. It's you and God and God alone. And that's an art. It's an art to move into the Holy of Holies. And it is something that this generation don't understand. And it's an art that's busy getting lost. Because people just put it into a microwave, put it in five minutes and the meal is ready. Fingers snap and God jumps. Uncertainties in life, difficulties in your life, there's things that just doesn't make sense. But it doesn't make sense. It is uncertain. It's not secure. It's not sure in the outer world. The answers is in the Holy of Holies, in the secret place. We have prayer meetings. Praise God for prayer meetings. Hallelujah. For prayer meetings. Because it's where you teach, where you learn, where you learn yourself. That stepping up, moving from the natural into, busy climbing the mountain, moving out of the Holy of out of the outer of, out of courts, moving into the holy, of, holy place and further on. We have prayer meetings. We've got so many corporate gatherings. Praise God for fellowship. Praise God for churches that's open. Thank you, God, for that. And it's wonderful. It's necessary. It is scriptural. It's supposed to be there. But in that all, there's people that attend prayer meetings, corporate gatherings that don't know God in spite of them being in the prayer meeting, in spite of them being in the corporate meeting. There's people that fast in spite of knowing God. Knowing that there's dimensions of God that have to be uniquely be revealed to you that only happens when you're alone with Him. There's things that God will never tell you when you're in a corporate place. When you're alone, yes, when you're alone, Jacob was alone. The Bible says in Genesis 32, 
that Jacob was about to see Esau. He was about to meet Esau because of what happened between Jacob and Esau. And he was afraid. He was not sure that's going to happen with him when he meets Esau. So in Genesis 32 verse 14 to 16, we see that Jacob came and because of his fear, he divided all his belongings. He divided everything that he had. And in verse 24 he said, and Jacob was left alone. And then a man came. And we know the story. You see, Jacob created an atmosphere that became his secret place. And a man came, wrestled with him until daybreak. Verse 26 says, And he, the angel said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And do you ever, ever in your life have that attitude towards God? God, I will not leave this place now if you don't speak to me. God, I will not. Have you ever been that persistent with God? Verse 27 to 30. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. Come on, church. Come on church, you have struggled with God and prevailed. You've pushed through, you've pushed in, you move, you got yourself up the, up the mountain. Now the only thing is you are up the mountain, you just need to get into the mountain. You work yourself through this, out, this outer court. You work yourself through into the holy place. You work yourself through the holy of holy place into the holy of holies. You have struggled with God and with men, but you've prevailed. You've reached the place that you need to be. Then Jacob asked him, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, What is that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Pinyal, for I have seen God face to face. And my life is preserved. He saw God face to face. If all of you is seen by everybody, I want you to hear this. This is sometimes very difficult. Especially when you are crafted and you've placed in the quiver and waiting for God's appointed time to be released. If all of you are seen by everybody, you will not be mighty in these end times. There are dimensions of your life and dealings with God that is not for public consumption. What do you say? God shares things with you in that secret place. God reveals things to you in that secret place that is not adequate. To deal with everybody. Why do you say that? Because there are things that God tells you. That is not for preaching. There are things that God tells you that is not for other people. Why? Because they are customized dealings. That should serve as the foundation for your spiritual stability. God speaks to you in a secret place. Things that secures you, roots you in Him. I want to say this to you. Friend, family, church. It is in a secret place where you get rooted in God. There is no seesaw effect in a secret place. There is no up and down, up and down. Tomorrow, today I'm up and tomorrow I'm down. Today I'm up and the day after I'm down. There is no thing like that in a secret place.
there are things that you perceive from the secret place that if you would share it with people you will lead them into error because it was uniquely communicated to you that was peculiar to your level of your alignment if God it's not healthy to share those things I want to say this to you like this that the instructions that you receive in a secret place the things that God gives you in a secret place that you need to obey and if you would share it and the receivers of that instruction receive that and do not keep by that don't keep by the obedience in that it will cause them to fall you need the secret place because it's there where God purposes you, where destiny is revealed, where God secures your footing. It's there where the roots are rooted into God, into the Word, into purpose, into planning, into destiny. The secret place, the place of the dealings of God with man. Man is not made in the church alone. I say it again. It's amazing to come together on Sundays or in the weekdays and fellowship together. It's scriptural. But man is made in the secret place. I'm talking about all men. Believers, born again children of God, sons and daughters of God are formed, are made in the secret place. So the secret place is a real place. It's a spiritual place that can also be reflected by a physical place, like I've explained it. I want you to hear this. There is a law in the spirit that is called the law of consistency. And the law of consistency states that whosoever you serve, you become the slave of that person. Just my paraphrase, let me read you the scripture. Do you not know, Romans 6 verse 16, do you not know that whom you pre present yourself slaves to Obey, you are that one slaves who you obey. What does it mean? It means this. If I'm struggling, if I go to pray, and I'm struggling, I'm struggling to pray, much distractions, and I, and I eventually I pray. Most of the time, I will pray in the flesh. You know what I'm saying? Most of the time, the prayers that's been prayed are in the flesh. So now, I've been, I've been going there and I pray and I pray and I pray and nothing happens. It's all in the flesh. And I'm discouraged. I'm, dis I'm discouraged. What do I do? I go there again. And I go there again, and I go and again. I will go back there for the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time, the seventh time, and I will keep on repeating this activity. I want to, I want to encourage you in prayer meetings. I want to encourage you to come to prayer meetings. The more you do it, the more you come, the more you pray, the more you pray, the better you get. Listen to this. It is the Holy Spirit that's responsible for prayer on the earth. But the dimensions of His operating is supplied by grace and sustained power in the prayer. The more you sustain it, the more you keep on doing it, you know what's, what's happening. It's attracting it through you. What is it called? Consistency. The more consistent you are, 
keep on doing it, keep on doing it. Even if you miss it, if you fail it, just keep on doing it. Keep on, keep on pushing through this, this outer court. Keep on, but I'm failed. Keep on doing it. Eventually, eventually, there will come a day, and this is the encouragement, there will come a day that you will go and pray, and suddenly you will come back in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when that day comes, I promise you, you will never struggle or stop praying again. You have to push through. You have to get up the mountain. You have to get up the mountain, into the mountain. You have to. You have to get there. The more you try it, the more you do it, that there will come that day when your consistency attracts that. And when you get there, you will never stop praying again. You will even pray in the sleep. And now you, you have become a slave to the influence of the Spirit. That's amazing. I hope you understand what I'm saying. It's the same thing with giving. When God asks you to give, and you are in a really in a disapproval of this giving of your seed. It's just because that grace for that giving is not yet been given unto you. But if you continue, many people had said to me previously, I give, but I'm, I'm not getting blessed in that. Just keep on doing it. Just keep on doing it. But if you continue in your obedience, your consistency is drawing to your life that grace and it's called the power to lay down your life it's that grace that conquers greed but there will come a day that that grace is so overwhelming and you know what happens then there will be nothing nothing that you will not give unto god including your life it will be something like what jesus said in john 10 18 i have the power to lay down my life you see but these things happen it happened in a secret place it's that place where you eventually come to the place where you can where you can entrust god with everything and God will entrust you with everything. And He knows that the more He gives unto you, the more He trusts you with stuff, the more you will release it. You will not keep it. You will release it. It's in the secret place that you build the trust. I'm going to close this morning with this. I, I, many times I just spoke now about moving up the mountain, Moses went up the mountain, but Jesus went into the mountain. And I, want, I just want to bring a kind of understanding to that. Maybe I will minister on that on a later time. When Jesus went to pray, he always went up and into the mountain. Matthew 14 verse 23, Luke 6 verse 12, Matthew 5 verse 1, John 6, Luke 6. It all says that. He moved, he went up the mountain and in the mountain. He went into the mountain. Okay. Why? Because God is not on the mountain. God is in the mountain. What does it mean? How does it influence us? Exodus 19. Verse 3 speaks of Moses. They've been now three months out of, out of Egypt. The Exodus, the third month of, of the Exodus. And Moses went up unto God. And the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Moses went up 
unto God and God pulled him out of the mountain. God was not on the mountain, God was in the mountain. So God called Moses, Moses went up unto God. And God was not on the mountain, God was in the mountain. Saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. But now, what happens now in Exodus 24? This was Exodus 19, Moses went up unto the mountain. Now in Exodus 24, Moses went up into the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The question is now, why didn't it happen previously? In Exodus 19, they are in the third month from the Exodus, the third month of their deliverance from Egypt. They were in the outer court. It was an outer court experience, the beauty God came down with redemption. Listen, God's not hiding when it comes to redemption. God comes down. God came down to redeem His people. He came down. So God was available there. He was available in the outer court. And God is about to give them instructions. He's about to give Moses the law. He's not yet given him the law. He's about to. Moses cannot receive the, the law in the outer court. There's just too many things going on there. Moses cannot receive the ordinances of God in the outer court. There's just too many things going on there. Now comes Exodus 24. Moses has been leading his people. He's been leading the people. And the more he's leading the people, the more God told him to push through the outer court, to push through into the holy place. And eventually, by his persistence, by his pursuit, his consistency, he pushed through and he, he finds himself in the Holy of Holies. And now, scripture says, and God called Moses up into the mountain. And Moses can went into the mountain. Let me explain it this, this way. The spiritual understanding of a mountain is this. A mountain represents an exalted state of mind where the divine plan may be perceived and unfold. It's a state of spiritualization. It's an, un, it's an exalted state of mind. God's got no problem with earthly things. He doesn't have issues. So God's mind is ex in exalted state. God's mind is totally kingdom. God's mind is about kingdom purposes. It's not about what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to drink, who's going to get healed, who's going to lay it off, who's going to get a job, who's going to get married. It's not this, it's not God. He's exalted state of mindset is about his business, kingdom business. And that is why God is in the mountain. And that's why God called you and me into the mountain. And God calls us into that state of mind. He calls us into the Holy of Holies, that state of mind where everything is about Him. Where you can unfold this divine plan and purpose for your life. Going up to the mountain to pray means this. To elevate your thoughts and your aspiration to the spiritual viewpoint of God. What does it say? Going up to the mountain, into the mountain. I'm leaving my ways of thinking behind 
as Moses left behind the people. And he had to get into this motion of pushing through this commotions of the outer court. As a prophetic picture in Moses' time, moving into this place of the holy place, pushing through that holy place into the secret place, into the holy of holies. God wants us to elevate our thoughts, to get our thought pattern out of this, this consumable, disorientated, dysfunctional place called the natural realm into a place with the aspiration to the viewpoint of what his intentions is. The beautiful thing about a mountain is that mountains don't move. They are ultimately symbol of stability. God is stable. God is a stable God. He doesn't have mood swings. He doesn't have difficulties or uncertainties. He doesn't have things that pulls him down. So when Jesus said this, when Jesus speaks of mountains being moved or even thrown into the sea as a result of faithful, consistent prayer, what did he mean? What did Jesus mean when he said that? He immediately invoking a human impossibility. What does it mean? It means you can get out of your state of mind that is produced in this atmosphere, in this location of the now environment of this earthly realm. You can get out of this and your mind can be elevated into a place that is exalted, a place that is totally focused and the viewpoint is God and God alone is God's kingdom, God's business. In the dealings of God with men, location and atmosphere matter. God wants you out of the atmosphere that you find yourself in. He wants you out of the location. He wants you to get away from your wife. He wants you to get away from your household, your children, your husband. And He says, come! I invite you up! I want to elevate your mindset! I want to get you out of your way of thinking. I want to get you out of your hopelessness. I want to get you into a place where your thoughts will be exalted. Where I can show you things pertaining to the kingdom. Everywhere is not favorable for a meeting place with God. Everywhere is not favorable for a meeting place with God. When it has to do with intimacy, when it has to do with walking with God, God does not expose Him callously. He's not just going to pitch up everywhere and anywhere. He's waiting for you to create that atmosphere. That location, that saying, God, help the Holy Spirit to elevate my thoughts by speaking correctly by moving into the direction of kingdom. All these things that surrounds me is just pulling me away from God. It's a drag. It drags me. It wants to consume me. 
The enemy has come to steal, to steal and to destroy. But Jesus has come so that you can have life and life in abundance to the full that it overflows. It doesn't mean two houses, three houses, five cars. It doesn't mean a cupboard full of food. It doesn't mean ten children. It means kingdom life. That exalted state of thoughts, what God has planned and purposed for you and me in His kingdom. But our focus, the focus of humanity is on the earthly realm, on the earthly things, the things that's temporal, the things that's going to die, everything. I said it before, I'm going to say it again. When you go outside and you look at that beautiful tree, I'm telling you, you're looking at something that's busy dying. Even if it's, if it's blooming, even if it's got flowers on it, even if it's got fruit, it's dying. God has something that is everlasting. There's everlasting trees, there's everlasting flowers, there's things that's alive and going to stay alive for eternity. They're not going to not going to die. But we are so so caught up, caught up in the natural. The natural is so real to us, and God wants us out. He wants us into a place of a secret place where He can eventually teaches and shows us reality of life. God hides Himself in the light. There's no darkness in God. There's no darkness in God. God is a God of the secret place. The secret place is a spiritual state. It's another mindset. It's an elevated, elevated mindset that is a thought pattern that's over and above what this natural realm consists of. That's why God doesn't meet you everywhere. That's why location and atmosphere matters. That's why you have to create in your house a place where you can go and meet God. I was asked the other day, do you and your wife do you do Bible study together? Do you pray together? These times that we do, yes. But normally, no, we don't. Why? Because if I'm with her and she wants to move into the secret place, I will be a distraction and the same way around. So when I go into my study, when I go into that place that I've created as my secret place, to enter the secret place, to enter that elevated thought pattern, the elevated mindset of God, that viewpoint of God, I cannot afford to have anybody with me or something with me that will be a distraction because that conversation there is vital. It's so vital. That's why it's hidden. And that's where I want to invite you into today. You have to. If you want to make it in this in this time, in this in this time, you're gonna to have to get to that place. A prophet in a nation, he said the other day, he said that this is the year of the God kind. Wow! Of the God kind. I'm telling you, these people are going to go astray this year because they, they, they are not building, creating, working on this place called intimacy with God. 
my heart's desire for you is that you'll find yourself pushing through this outer court into the holy place and find yourself facing the Ark of Covenant, the place where God is. He's there and He's waiting there. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you to come because He's got something to tell you about you and all the people around you. About the now time, your life, future and your destiny. Amen. Don't, don't let this world and its surroundings become your life. And think this only life there is. There is a greater life of God that gives you the power and the authority that gives you the moment where you can survive in this. I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, when you said in John 14, you said the only way to the Father is through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he who comes to the Father must do it through me. And this morning, I'm so grateful, Lord Jesus, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And you've come and you've given us life in abundance. To the full, to the overflow. Wow. You're a great God. There's many questions this, this, this day that's involving in the mindsets of, of your children. People's got questions. People question you. They've got questions about the nation, the world, what's happening economy there's so many things that's going on but one thing is also true there's so many people that find their comfort in the earthly stuff and not in you for that reason father i pray i pray for our family our cross generation family. I pray for the body of Christ this morning. That everyone will come under the convincing and convicting of the Holy Spirit. That the only way to make it, to survive, to live that life that you brought Jesus is to be fully overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit is to find themselves in a place of secret where the hidden things, the covered things, the veiled things regarding the now time, the now season of our lives will be revealed. But to get there is to lay down all these things that's just a drawback. All these things that pulls you down. All these things that's in your way, lay it down and pursue God. Pursue God, chase after God. Become a God, chase. Seek Him deliberately, forcefully. Push in, go through, and go through. See him face to face. The secret place is real world. It's a reserved place where so many mysteries are revealed. And my heart's desire is for every born again child of God to come to that place of understanding and living, habitually, dwelling in a secret place. 
under the shadow of the Most High. And I thank you for the Father because it's possible. It's possible. Grateful for that Father that you called us into the stability of your mindset that is higher than ours. That's way higher than our thoughts. But you called us into that place where we can become in agreement with you to the viewpoint of what you have for us. I thank you, Father, for kingdom. I thank you, Father, that persistence and practice becomes proficient. Thank you, Father, that we can practice and practice and practice and eventually it becomes prophecy. We enter into it. And then we dwell there amongst those that stand there, amongst those that stay with you, according to Zechariah. I thank you, Father, that it's not secluded, it's not con it's not excluded. It is unveiled. But you, you looking for the location and the atmosphere. And you're not going to meet us everywhere. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. We just love you. We love you so much. And I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I thank you so much that you join us. I invite you to, uh, to remember 3 o'clock this afternoon. We're going to pray together for our nation against this virus. And we're going to decree God's healing power. Exodus 15, 26 says, I am the God that healed thee. He's not going to. He already does. He has. Just reveal. God is a God that healed thee. This nation is healed. This nation is healed. Revival is coming to this nation. Be blessed. Have a beautiful day. See you next time. Bye-bye.